uh, including the Southwest chapter. Uh, some summary, a summary of some of the impacts that we should expect to see uh, from climate change, particularly focusing here, but also more generally. And I want to end, this is a little more complicated, uh, but the world is complicated. And you know, a lot of things are changing in our environment, not just climate. So we have to think about how climate change interacts with changes in um, from urbanization, for example, or from invasive species, or um, other kinds of stressors that ecosystems are experiencing. So I want to end with this more complex sort of look at how multiple stressors are interacting and affecting ecosystems. Okay, so climate change. Uh, it is a consequence of an enhancement of the greenhouse effect. So let's just talk about what the greenhouse effect is. This cartoon is essentially an energy budget for the Earth. The Earth, of course, gets its energy from uh, the sun. This powers the climate system. It's the cause of air circulation, water circulation, and so forth, differential heating from the sun. But when this radiation comes in from the sun, some of it is reflected by the Earth and the atmosphere. Um, some of it is absorbed and re-radiated. About half of this radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface and it warms the Earth, right? Um, and then any, any material that uh, receives radiation is also going to re-radiate back that radiation at some longer wavelength. So we think of this infrared radiation as being emitted from the Earth and various other uh, bodies. So this is a really simplified idea about the infrared uh, radiation uh, that is being re-emitted by the Earth. That's a natural process. And as it is re-emitted, some of it is reabsorbed by gases in the atmosphere. So these are called greenhouse gases because they act like a greenhouse. They make it warmer because they reabsorb that long wave radiation. So how do they work? Well, here's, here's a spectrum. Um, this is just how much uh, energy is in, uh, coming in in radiation along a series of wavelengths. So the wavelength of um, that radiation. From the very uh, short wavelengths, which are things like the ultraviolet ra radiation, all the way out, to, uh, way out here to um, long infrared radiation. And it goes further, you know, you have radio waves out there and so forth. Uh, but this is just really the, um, and, and somewhere in here we have the visible spectrum, right? So this is all of the radiation that's coming in. This black line or the yellow is kind of what's hitting the outer atmosphere. And, you know, we have ozone, and you've heard about the ozone layer. Uh, ozone uh, in the stratosphere actually absorbs a lot of that short wave radiation. And that's a good thing because it's not very good for you. It's the kind of thing, the UVB you hear that you put the sunscreen on for. So that's absorbing that. And then you have this, uh, the red is what's actually hitting the Earth. And so you see you have a number of other places where gases in the atmosphere are <laughs> absorbing that radiation. And what's absorbing out here is water, largely, and carbon dioxide, OK? So what this greenhouse effect essentially does is it changes the conditions of the Earth. It changes the extent to which the sun's radiation can warm the Earth. And we know this by looking, we've known this for you know, decades, uh, we know this by looking at the temperatures of um, Earth and its nearest neighbors. So Venus is a very hot planet, 450 degrees C. Well, it's closer to the sun, right? So it has more radiation coming in. Mars is farther away, so it has less coming in. And Earth's temperature, and these are in centigrade, is about 13 degrees. But really, the story here isn't just how close these are to the sun. It's rather what their atmospheres are composed of. So this pressure tells us how much of an atmosphere each one of those planets has. Venus has a really, really thick atmosphere. It has a lot, it has a pressure 90 times as much atmosphere as the Earth has, whereas Mars has very little. And then the greenhouse gases that are in those atmospheres, over 90% of Venus's atmosphere is CO2, about 0.04%, you'll see that later, of the Earth's atmosphere is CO2, and about 1% is water, and over 80% CO2 in Mars. However, this doesn't do much because there's not a very big atmosphere. Um, so what we would expect for the temperature of Mars 
If it wasn't for that greenhouse effect, it would be minus 57 degrees. In fact, it's minus 53 degrees. What we would expect for the Earth if we didn't have these greenhouse gases is that the Earth would be minus 18 degrees. It would be much, much colder than it is. And in fact, we're, we're lucky that we have the greenhouse effect because it keeps the Earth warmer. Um, and then if we had uh, in, in, uh, in Venus, actually, the temperature would be minus 46 degrees, except for uh, these, this very, very high abundance of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay. So that's how the greenhouse effect works. And now I'm going to tell you something else. The greenhouse effect is not controversial. Everybody agrees that it occurs, right? What the controversy that you hear about is whether the greenhouse effect has been enhanced by human activities, OK? So when somebody says, oh, the greenhouse effect, that doesn't happen, you say, we've known that that's happened since the 1800s. It is not controversial, OK? All right, so here, here is some information about how we know um, that the greenhouse effect on Earth uh, is having an impact on temperature. This plot here, which is um, uh, a, an isotopic form of uh, hydrogen, gives us an indication of the sur surface temperature of the Earth. And you can see how it's varied over the th um, up to 600, 800,000 years prior to now. Uh, and it seems to vary in concert with these greenhouse gases. So this is CO2, the one I've been talking about. This is methane, and this one is nitrous oxide. So those are the three important greenhouse gases. And you can see that the variation, when these things go up, the temperature goes up. So we know these greenhouse gases are, are, are increasing the temperature when they increase in, in abundance. But what we're going to focus on here is the enhanced greenhouse effect. And so look at these variations over 800,000 years. And then look at this last bit. This is not the side of the graph. That actually is the increase that we're seeing in the modern era, in the Anthropocene, uh, in the concentration of methane, uh, CO2, and N2O. Big increase, much bigger than anything that we've seen in variability in the past. Here's a, a closer plot. This is just for the last 2,000 years. Pretty, here they are bumping along. They're changing. Yeah, they're variable. It's true. CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide all vary over time. But this is what we're talking about. Post-industrial increases in CO2, methane, and N2O. The greenhouse gases are increasing in concentration. We know this. It's a fact. So the controversy is, is that causing a change in our climate? Uh, here is the uh, most famous, one of the most famous plots in science. This is called the uh, Keeling curve. Uh, uh, Keeling decided um, back in uh, 1960 that it would be a good idea to start measuring CO2 concentration someplace where it wasn't affected a lot by human activities. And so he um, started measuring CO2 on the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And uh, this is a picture of that CO2 and how it's increased since 1960. Okay, this is only going up till about 2008 or so. Here's where we are today. I just checked this for January of 2014. We are almost at 400 parts per million per volume. Um, almost at 400, so 0.04 percent of the atmosphere. Um, and notice the other thing that's interesting here is this biospheric effect. So this is all of the plants and animals and everything and the increases and decreases in CO2 that are caused largely by seasonal changes in the northern hemisphere. So ecosystems that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere for photosynthesis and putting it back into the atmosphere um, for respiration and decomposition. So there's always this variability that you see superimposed, annual variability superimposed on this really big upward trend. This is a picture of that annual cycle in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so is that, any questions about that? Causes of the minor, relatively minor increases in the um, There are, oh yes, uh, the question was are there notions about why the, the gases have increased and decreased in the past. Uh, yes, um, there are. Uh, there are some changes that are due to, um, to cycles of the sun. There are some changes that are due to 
shorter term uh, impacts and I am not not being a um, atmospheric scientist I can't rattle those off for you but yes there are good ideas about why those things have varied in the past um, I don't know if you would superimpose the ice ages on those where those would appear for example and uh, what the causes are those they have to do with sun cycles and so forth um, but uh, I think the important point is that you know, what we're seeing as an increase is not something that's ever been seen. Both the rate and magnitude of increase has not ever previously been seen in uh, the <coughs> record for, for greenhouse gases. Anything else? Okay. Um, okay, so, well, this is caused by something. Any guesses? <laughs> Post-industrial increases in carbon dioxide are caused by the emissions of carbon dioxide uh, due to human activities. And human activities are emitting carbon dioxide largely because we are taking advantage of a period in the ancient history when there was a lot of uh, uh, capture of CO2 by photosynthesis in the Carboniferous period, right? Love the way you name those things. Lots of capture of carbon dioxide by photosynthesis a uh, lot of uh, production of organic material, carbon-related compounds, plants and marshes and so forth. That's when the, uh, you know, there was really quite big and large and lots of biomass on Earth. Um, and that was laid down in fossil fuels. That became fossil fuels. So we're harvesting that ancient primary production, now burning it. And when we burn it, we're reversing that the photosynthesis equation that has CO2 plus water is O2 plus um, carbon uh, plus organic carbon. We're reversing that. We're taking that organic carbon that was in the fossil fuels, burning it, and releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. That's where it's coming from. <coughs> Who's doing it? Um, this is just uh, CO2 emissions uh, by country. So the biggest emitter now in 2008 and since 2008 is uh, China. That's largely because China has the most people not because they are using, uh, burning lots of fossil fuels. In fact, here's their per capita, what each person is burning. In China, the United States has only exceeded in per capita carbon dioxide emissions by Australia. Okay, so this is the way the countries sort of lay out in terms of their total emission and in terms of the per capita emissions. Okay, so there are other things, obviously, I, I mentioned the CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. It is the most important one. There are other things that affect climate, and they're, climatologists call these forcings, but just so you know, because it says that up here. Um, you don't have to remember that. Uh, but we have these greenhouse gases that have uh, a warming effect, methane, N2O, <laughs> halocarbons, those are things like CFCs. Um, we also have uh, ozone that has a different effect depending on whether it's high in the atmosphere or low in the atmosphere. And then we have things like surface albedo. That's how reflective the surface is. A white roof versus a black roof, right? Snow versus grass. Uh, and so in general, surface albedo uh, right now is having a negative effect. Um, we also have, that, that's a cooling effect. We also have aerosols in the atmosphere that have a cooling effect. Um, and if we look at this on balance, what we find is that human activities, all these things that are increasing human activities, increasing the warming, on balance are causing a warming. But just to remember that there are things that will cool the climate system. So how much is due to uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions is the question, and this is kind of giving you an answer for that. That comes from the 2007 IPCC, and I think that that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think that's not likely to change a whole lot. Okay, so we also have evidence that global temperature is increasing. Uh, this is a plot that comes from uh, sort of around the Industrial Revolution, uh, showing increases. This red circle encloses 12 of the uh, hottest years on record, which are all in the very recent past. Okay. And these are just, these lines are just sort of different periods of time in which you can look at the rate of change. There's variability, clearly, right? There's variability from one year to the next. This is a global average temperature. It says nothing about what's happening here versus what's happening in Alaska. 
Uh, but the global average temperature, the slope of the change over time is increasing over time. So it's accelerating. Um, also, uh, and I, know, I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but temperature in the climate system has a very strong impact on the hydrologic system. So how much rain is falling, um, how much of that is evaporating, how much of it is running off, um, the impacts of the oceans. And so here are some land uh, changes um, in drought and wet conditions. So these are uh, um, what, what you see is the uh, um, Palmer Drought se Severity Index. It's just an index of how uh, bad drought is, and I'm not sure for what region this is. I think this might be for the Southwest, showing an increase um, over about a 100-year time frame. But the important point, I guess, to note is that this is a little more <laughs> difficult to predict than temperature. Um, it's also much more variable across the Earth, and there are some places that are getting wetter and some places that are getting drier. And the places that are getting wetter are projected to get wetter still, and the places that are getting drier are projected to get drier still. And we happen to live in a place that is projected to get drier. Okay. Um, another question that you often hear in the climate change debate is how, um, how has climate change and climate affected uh, extreme events? How has it affected the occurrence of uh, hurricanes, uh, storms, heavy rainfall events, uh, um, tidal um, surges? How has it affected sea level? How has it affected uh, the frozen parts of Earth, the cryosphere? And so here are just some, some pictures of, this is obviously the, uh, uh, one of the neighborhoods that was pretty devastated by Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, this is a picture that shows you some infrastructure being uh, strongly affected, urban infrastructure being strongly affected by storm events. Um, this is a projection actually for parts of New York City, Manhattan that would be inundated under particular scenarios of, of sea level rise. And this is an actual photo, photo comparing a hundred years difference in Olympic National Park for the Lillian Glacier. So what we're seeing is a complete disappearance of that glacier in this case. Um, I want to make one caveat about storms. One thing that is quite clear is that any given single event should not be attributed to climate change, just as the very cold winter that we're having right now is not evidence that there is no climate change. We're talking about weather events, and they comprise together, uh, climate system comp comprises a, the, the assembly of all of those weather events. So I'm not saying that Superstorm Sandy is a climate change effect, but what I will say is that the increased frequency of events like this may well be a consequence of climate change. And that has been borne out by models and also by data. So let's look at some data. Um, this is just, again, for, this is actually for the last 30 years. Um, this is uh, for the world, and this is for um, the United States. Uh, this shows you billion dollar weather climate disasters. I think you can see, uh, you can imagine an increase. We don't know if that's necessarily going to increase or maybe come down again. Um, but we see that also in um, the world records. This is the record from Munich Re. These reinsurance companies are really great resources for this kind of thing because um, that's what their business is. The red lines are events that are unrelated to the climate. The rest of these colors, uh, it's very hard to read that, sorry. Um, it's very hard to read that. Uh, <laughs> this is hydrological events, the blue. Um, this is climatological events like heat extremes, this is the orange, and this is something else that's weather related. So you can see that all of those have increased, whereas there hasn't been an increase in these geophysical uh, disturbances. Here's uh, some data sets from uh, sea level, uh, seven different data sets. They're all pretty much superimposed on each other. These are not projections. These are actual data, what's happened. Uh, sea ice extent, three data sets, pretty well superimposed on each other. Um, and this is uh, snow cover in the northern hemisphere. Not quite as much of a trend that you can see there. Uh, glacier mass balance, you can see a trend of decreasing mass balance of glaciers. 
So looks like we have data that suggest that the cryosphere is, is shrinking, that sea level is rising, and that extreme events are increasing in frequency. So how much of this is really due to people? That's the question. That's the question that you're always going to hear. And um, one way that we can, we can wait, and we can just run out this experiment for the next uh, 100 years and see how we do, uh, it would be probably a better idea to try to get an idea using you know, the very good brains and computer equipment that we have around here to maybe generate some models that would allow us to understand that. And so models are used extensively in the climate community. And uh, this is an application of models that isn't forward looking, but it's looking at separating out the effects of uh, natural forcings, that is those factors that cause climate to vary, with anthropogenic forcings. And that would be largely CO2, but it could be also you know, CO2 emissions, but it could also be things like burning biomass in the tropics. So what they have done is to backcast, essentially to generate the blue is the model without any of those human actors. So you take that human activity out, the human forcings out, and this is what would happen. Let's just look down here. Global temperature anomaly, that means how much temperature has changed. Uh, the blue is without human impacts, without human forcings. The pink is with um, global land, global ocean. In all of these cases, somewhere a little bit after World War II, we start to see a, um, a diversion uh, of these things. And they, and they happen regionally uh, in different regions to different extents, uh, but all of them are starting to show that uptick, okay? which is, of course, the famous hockey stick, but let's just not talk about that right now. Okay, so it seems to me that the models are suggesting that if we take out the impact of humans, those things we know are forced by, by um, increases carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and so forth, that, um, that we would be sort of tooling along, maybe we'd have a warm period, a cool period, but that there's a real bifurcation, there's a real distinct transition uh, in the last century. So models obviously are also used for future scenarios, and you have um, no doubt heard about these. Um, the models have to be good at predicting or at, at matching what has happened in the past. Um, but then models can be used to explore what would be the impact of different scenarios, different decisions that we might make as a society. Uh, and so that's what these are. These are um, different scenarios that have been developed by um, the um, AR3, which was the last uh, four, which is the last uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change, it developed a series of scenarios, had to do with how much control and so forth people would have uh, on, on emissions. So you can see that there's a wide range of what we might expect to be just the future warming, uh, and I think this is for the end uh, by 2100, these numbers here give you the range of what we might expect given these different scenarios. I should point out that where we are right now is actually above this highest line. In terms of the trajectory of CO2 emissions, we're above the highest line. Uh, this is where we'd like to get to, and what does that take? It takes massive rethinking about the way that we live um, on the planet and so forth. Okay, so now I'm going to move into this impact. I'm sorry, that took a long time, but um, I'm going to move into this impact just real quickly. Uh, I did spend two years in D.C. I, I was involved in this, which is um, a strategic plan for the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, one of the, the goals of the U.S. GCRP is to conduct sustained assessments of the impact of global change on U.S. systems. So the th uh, third climate assessment, this is the third time this has happened, even though since 1990 it's been mandated to happen every four years, that has actually not happened. Um, so the goal is the, to really to try to help us to anticipate and mitigate and adapt to the kinds of changes that we should expect to see. Um, we have a, a vision that you can read here. Um, these are uh, printouts of the first and second uh, national climate assessments that came out in book form. Uh, this one in 2000 and this one in 2009. Um, I was involved in working on this one as well. Um, 
but the third NCA is a much more broad-ranging process that's similar to the IPCC process, and we're actually not at the point where the full report has been released because there still is uh, evaluation and uh, review going on. Um, as part of this, uh, there were regional reports that were done to varying degrees of completeness. This is the Southwest report, and it was one of the best ones. It really was a very, very complete process that was done here, and that was headed up by Greg Garfin at the University of Arizona. Okay, so the National Climate Assessment looks at a variety of sectors, as well as um, some sectors that cross, that interact with each other, so not just water resources, but how does water and energy and land use interact with each other. So these were new to the third assessment, these, these new things. Um, notice also that three of them have to do with people, places where people are involved, so urban systems, tribal and native systems, and rural communities were components of this. Um, I worked on the ecosystems and biodiversity sector as well as the impacts on biochemical cycles in the urban sector. We also have the regions. Here they are. You'll see these again because this region is the one that we're going to focus on. I just put this down here to point out that this is a dry region. This is a, a map of a, a dry, dry and unproductive region. There are some cross cuts for biogeographical systems as well that I probably won't talk to about a whole lot. Okay, so what did we learn? What's new from this climate assessment compared to the last one, which was done four years ago? Um, the data have been, continued to improve. We have a better understanding of what's happening, increased knowledge. Um, there's nothing that we decided, oh, that was wrong. We're going the other direction. Pretty much all of these trends uh, and previous findings from previous assessments have been confirmed and strengthened with new data. Uh, we can observe, we can observe change in the climate system and impacts in all sectors and regions. That's important. It's not just, is it going to happen in a half a century? It's happening now. We can observe changes in all regions and sectors. Um, so this, this is, is about the process. Any of you can get involved in, uh, well, it's actually too late now, but the next one, you can get involved with public comment. Um, and you know, we think that the risks to this nation and to the world are continuing to grow. So it's worth paying attention to. I'm sorry this is going to be a bummer of a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Just realize that, you know. <laughs> yeah, get some cookies. Be happy, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll go through quickly some of the changes that have been observed. So these, this m map plots the changes in Fahrenheit now um, because the National Climate Assessment is taking the U.S. measurement system. So we're using <laughs> Fahrenheit. Um, so this, this shows us the changes that have been observed and then plots over time uh, for the temperature anomaly. That is the difference from the, um, the period uh, that we're comparing to, which is uh, 19... Uh, 01 to 1960, and uh, you can see that some areas are warming up more than others, and the southwest is one of the, uh, one of the um, stars in this, uh, 1.6 degrees since 1901. Um, we are seeing, you know, certainly the last decade has been the hottest and fourth driest in the century. Um, okay, uh, frost-free days. This is a really important for ecosystems because it affects uh, the growing cycle, the growing season length. Um, so frost-free days, uh, how they've increased in that same uh, comparison period, um, and the southwest is really, really big in this in this regard. So you can see here a plot of um, the growing season length and how that has increased over the last century. Uh, this has a pretty strong impact on a variety of things. An example. Uh, from this inset picture here is that um, the pine bark beetle, which is a big problem in some of the mountain forests, uh, has, in, because of these longer growing seasons, can actually emerge earlier and sometimes even get two generations in, in a single growing season. So that means the impacts of that population uh, or those populations can increase quite a lot. Uh, annual precipitation. Uh, you can see that the mid uh, Continent areas are get definitely getting wetter, and there's good evidence for that. 
in the Southwest, forget it. It's way too variable here for us to say that we have seen at this point a um, consistent change in precipitation. The record is simply not long enough for us to be able to tell that. Plus, we know from tree ring studies down at, the, down at U of A that there have been periods of time in the last, you know, sort of millennia where there have been these super mega droughts in the Southwest. So this is a highly variable uh, system in terms of that. Okay, and then extreme events. This is just one extreme event. This is heavy rains. Um, those have increased dramatically in the Northeast and the Midwest. Not so much in the Southwest. That's not a significant increase there. So for the Southwest, what's really happening? Uh, snowpack and stream flow amounts are expected to decline. Uh, Irrigation-dependent crops are vulnerable to extremes, so we might expect to see reduced yields. Um, increased warming, drought, insect outbreaks, uh, as I was just talking about with the pine bark beetle, that are linked to, cl to uh, climate change have uh, resulted in increased wildfires and impacts to people and ecosystems from those fires. Uh, I have a little more to say about fires in a minute. Flooding and erosion in coastal areas, um, for instance in California, are already occurring. Sea level rise is occurring. Um, and in cities, uh, which are where most of the people live, even more than on average in the U.S. In the Southwest, uh, over 90% of the population lives in cities. Uh, combined climate and urban heat island induced temperature rise um, are certainly causing uh, threats to public health and, um, and costs as well. And that's some of the research that um, you can see on posters around here that people have done here in, uh, in CAF LTR and other groups. So here's something else that's happening in the Southwest. Um, people like to move here. Uh, there was a little break in uh, moving here in 2008, but, um, in this, uh, but these are uh, changes by state in uh, population. Um, projected changes show us just continuing to increase in population, and those population are, people are going to move to population centers. So this is a map of development the red is cities, urban cities. Um, the orange is exurban development in 2000. And this is a projection for 2050 for the Southwest. It doesn't look like a lot, but you know, cities are concentrating so much activity of humans that it, it does have a big impact. These are growth rates for different cities in the Southwest. Um, Phoenix, 29%. Las Vegas, 42%. Uh, Albuquerque, 24%. And that is for the period of 20, 2000 to 2010. Okay, so uh, another aspect of heat is not just the mean temperature, but um, the extreme events. And we all know about that when we live here in Phoenix. Um, days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit for different emission scenarios. This is projected for the future. Um, and all of these places are expected to see increases in the number of days over 100 degrees. Well, we already have them, right? <laughs> we may have those, but we are expected to uh, go out of the chart, off the chart with respect to uh, under higher emission scenario with respect to the number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and interestingly, here's a plot uh, that shows uh, changes in the number of days where we get frost, pretty much almost none. And I know when I moved here that we would get a frost like every year, and that's just not happening anymore. That was back here in you know, this early period. And then this is misery days. Those are days over 100 degrees increasing. That's the, that's the actual record for this region, for Phoenix. Okay, how will hydrology change? Um, again, hydrology is much more difficult because it's very, very difficult to predict in a highly variable area, but there are some things that we know. We know that there's a reduction in snowpack, and we expect that. And many of the cities in the southwest are highly dependent on mountain snowfall and snowpack to deliver water supplies. Um, so this is projected changes um, by mid-century uh, for April, um, uh, April to July and June. Uh, uh, this is runoff. This is soil water equivalent. So that would be how much snowpack there is. This is how much is actually coming out of the mountains during the spring runoff, and this is how much soil moisture. Um, all of these are showing red, so it shows a projected change or loss of water supplies. 
Also, under higher emission scenarios, we expect, especially in the spring, to see really, really dry conditions, a big, big loss of winter rains. And you know around here, winter rains are really, they're half of our rain, but they produce 90, over 90% 90 of the runoff uh, associated with those rains. So water supply sort of regionally and uh, for the entire country um, is uh, projected to, we're expected to see some water scarcity. Um, these two maps here are uh, water supply sustainability risk index that were developed from a number of different uh, metrics by, um, by uh, Roy et al. I think it's Roy, didn't put the citation here. Um, but they also added for 2050, this is without climate change and this is with climate change. So clearly climate change will exacerbate this uh, stress on water resources. And for much of the Southwest, it's already pretty stressed. So the climate change impact is, is pretty big. At the same time, we have this population growth. This is the percent change in population, I believe, between 1970 and 20. 10, so it's, it's a little outdated, but you can see that, you know, this region has a lot of uh, growth, population growth in it, uh, a lot of people moving to the cities of the southwest. So that is sort of colliding with this, with this water supply change. Um, interestingly, this is uh, the per capita water use for southwestern cities, and we're doing pretty well as far as being more efficient about the water use. A lot of that has to do with changing irrigation systems, more drip irrigation, for example, less standing there with a hose. And, uh, and that's great. But because the populations are increasing, the overall water use is still increasing. And in fact, there's been quite a lot of work done here at ASU, primarily by the Decision Center for a Desert City, um, talking about the Phoenix water supply and suggesting that it really, under most climate change and population growth scenarios, the water supply is not sustainable for this region without a major change in lifestyle, in, in consumption patterns. And this is just a really good example of what I mean by that lifestyle thing. Can you see that all right? I forgot to turn this off. You see that? All oh, those pools. <laughs> Okay, so moving to the last bit, um, sorry I'm going a little uh, long. The last bit, I started to introduce that by talking to you about climate change and urbanization and how they're sort of on this collision course. Uh, this is a, a really striking photograph of wildfire in Southern California and you can see that coming very close to the um, urban development uh, in Southern California. You hear about this in the news all the time. Um, how does that have to do with climate change? Well, part of it has to do with you know, where people are building their houses, frankly, and, uh, and some of the policies of controlling fire and so forth. But under increased warming and drought and these insect outbreaks that potentially make um, trees more susceptible, the, uh, all of these things can be linked in some way to climate change, maybe a couple steps. And uh, so we're thinking about big potential impacts to people at the wildland urban interface. Um, so this is a, an example of uh, how building loss by fires at the California Wildland Urban Interface has increased. Um, this is 1990 to the decade of the 90s. This is the decade of the 2000s um, compared to previously. Um, I'm not saying that that, I'm just saying that this is something we need to be aware of and it may be, it may be caused by people's behavior, it may be caused partially by changes from climate, it may be, it may be management practices but they're complex interactions that we need to think about. Um, we think about climate change versus urbanization. These are kind of some of the changes that we expect for the Southwest, and here are some of the changes we expect in terms of urbanization. And some of the things that I um, haven't had time to really go into, um, you know, is that, you know, in cities, uh, we have already conditions associated with the urban heat island that are very similar to what we might project to be the regional temperature in 2050. Um, we also have increasing water demand and, and some issues about the inequality of how much people of different kinds that live in different places are exposed to these, to these risks. So a lot of um, concern about that. Um, I'm just one more example and then I'll be done. Um, and this, <laughs> that's why I thought this is such a bummer of a talk. 
Um, so the Lost Conscious fire, which happened in 2011 in New Mexico, um, was the largest fire ever in New Mexico until 2012, when a larger one occurred. Uh, but this fire um, burned 63 houses, 1,100 archaeological sites, and more than 60% of Bandelier National Monument, um, and uh, more than 80% of forested lands in the Santa Clara Native American Pueblo. Um, so there were n rare and endangered species there, a salamander, uh, for example, and um, they were threatened uh, with mortality, experienced near complete mortality. Um, there was a big loss of tree and shrub cover. Um, this lot resulted in a loss of nesting habitat for the spotted owl, the Mexican spotted owl, which is an endangered species there in, uh, in New Mexico. Um, and so uh, uh, lots, of, lots of impacts of this fire uh, on the ecosystems and, and populations in the region. So let's just think about how that potentially might um, associate with uh, climate change. Um, so after the fire there were heavy rainstorms, right? We don't know for the southwest whether those heavy rainstorms are increasing. We think they're probably, there's no evidence that they have so far. But this led to major flooding and erosion including at least 10 debris flows where not just the water but lots and lots of sediment are coming down that originated from the uh, the slopes of canyons that had been uh, denuded by the fires. Um, and recreation areas in the monument had to be evacuated for about four weeks. There were lots of flash floods. They damaged the um, infrastructure that was built there in the park. But that, not only that, but this, you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but that's not just water there. It's just kind of a muddy mess. Um, and all of this water and sediment is being carried down into the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande is the major water supply for the city of Albuquerque. Um, and so Albuquerque had to close their intakes for, um, I think it was several weeks, um, because they, weren't, they were just getting clogged by this debris. So a real impact on a fairly large population of the, of, of the Southwest. Um, it, was, it was closed for a week and then reduced intakes uh, to, to, for several months because it was really difficult to treat that water. So how do these things ha happen? You know, if, if drought intensifies, I don't know if you can see there's little asterisks on the things that I think might relate to climate change. Intensified drought management practices don't relate, but those things combine to increase fire susceptibility. Bark beetle populations maybe expanded life cycles and they increase fire su susceptibility. So we, we are seeing increased fire frequency and severity that has been linked um, specifically to climate change in uh, scientific papers. This results in loss of forest revenue, obviously, um, but also combined with increased heavy rains may result in increased erosion, impaired water quality, and risk to property and health. So the point I'm trying to get across is there's lots of interactions that are potentially in, uh, uh, confounding each other here, and so we can't, you know, we, we, we really need to think about how we manage these things in the face of all of these uh, kinds of stressors. So that's the end of my depressing presentation. Thanks very much for listening. That's depressing. What's the good news? You can ask me that. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. So that is coming from the atmospheric <laughs> chemistry of the, oh, I'm sorry, the ozone warnings in the city are coming from the combination of, um, uh, they're, they're coming from the atmospheric chemistry uh, associated with um, largely automobile exhaust. Uh, so a variety of uh, ions that are sort of floating around in the atmosphere are combining to create ozone. And, um, and that is damaging, it's potentially damaging to your health. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with um, climate change. It's more of a local air pollution phenomenon mm -hmm. than climate change. Yeah. Um, I'm not from the US, so maybe these questions are a little bit basic, but uh, is there any opportunity in terms like, for instance, for Russia, there's arable lands that will be increasing. Is there any opportunity for the US? Like, have you seen something that you say, well, 
here we could increase that and that favors I don't know economy or whatever and second question is like are there any thoughts on the cities on southwestern cities to increase density in order to have maybe more efficient energy flows or not so this is these are great questions the questions have to do first of all are there any sort of broader US um, actions that can be taken on land use for example that might help to mitigate or change the effects of these greenhouse gases. Um, and I said mitigate, that's kind of one of the things that we need to do. We need to reduce emissions and we need to find a way to keep that carbon dioxide from going into the atmosphere. Um, the second thing is, are there ways that we can densify cities? Um, densification may have an effect that would allow us to um, reduce our carbon emissions, which is a mitigation, but it may also, if we do it in a smart way, allow us to be cap more capable of adapting to the change that's already going to happen. So there's kind of these two things that have to happen simultaneously. Uh, since about 2009, there's been a really big interest in what's called climate adaptation. What can we do given that climate is changing? How can we um, change our, our infrastructure, our city designs, our lifestyles in order to be able to deal with it because it's going to happen no matter if we stopped emitting right now, it's still going to happen. That's it's kind of locked in. Um, the other thing is to mitigate and how do we get rid of um, more of that carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere. Two ways to do that. One is uh, one way to mitigate is to stop emitting so much. <laughs> and so it seems like for the Southwest, one of the main things we can do is really go in big for alternative energy sources that don't um, that don't emit carbon dioxide, that aren't burning fossil fuels. Uh, another one is um, is to actually capture that carbon dioxide, which is what you're. I don't know if you you know. There's another aspect of biofuel development, which is uh, something that's going. There's a lot of interest in. Don't get me started on that, but I really think it is not, it is not a panacea. It's probably not a good thing. At this point, biofuels uh, cost more energy to produce than they produce themselves. So that's, that's not, definitely not a panacea and probably not even, and think of all the land that would have to go over to biofuels. Uh, but you can also think about um, capturing that carbon in some way. Um, and you know, reforestation is one way to capture carbon because that's a big uh, sink for carbon. Uh, but it doesn't have, it's not limitless. It's, it's not limitless. Yeah. Sort of a two-part question to follow up to that. Um, are there any magic bullets out there that uh, could capture carbon seeding the ocean with, with something to increase plankton? Or um, I, I hear of these giant boxes suck up carbon. Are, are any of those real? And a follow-up to that, if you had to move somewhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> where, where would you move? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so the first question is, uh, are any of these carbon capture strategies real? And, um, you know, I think they're all worth investigating. Um, but I'm there's, there's this sort of, there's this kind of pervasive attitude that we will be able to figure it out because we always have been, because we're people and people are creative and innovative and we'll be able to work this out. So sitting around on our hands and waiting for somebody to, I mean, I think all of these things are worth doing. All of these things are worth doing. It's worth exploring. I'm not sure whole scale iron fertilization of the ocean is something I would advocate, clearly, um, because there's not really good evidence that that would have the desired impact. But um, Wally Broker here was a visiting scholar here, and he's got some ideas about a carbon capture design that seems pretty pretty cool. I mean, why not? So let's get some funding and let's try it. That would be good. Um, but I think the point I want to make is both things have to happen because we're really on this trajectory that's way above where we need to be. And everybody talks about doubling CO2. What if we go to triple? What do, we, what do we do then? I mean, it's not like you double and then, okay, that's it. We got to double CO2. We're stopping now. It doesn't happen that way. And nobody talks about what's beyond that. And so that's a really, really important thing to keep in mind. We have to do both. We have to reduce emissions, find, you know, if we can find some geo, you know, way, some way of capturing the carbon, great. 
we also have to figure out how we're going to live in that. And so to your second question, where would I live if I could live anywhere? Um, you know, I'm going to be a city dweller uh, because I think that I actually do believe that that is probably where we're going to find some sustainable solutions. I'm not saying the cities are sustainable now, but I think that given the population trajectory we're on, if everybody was evenly distributed across the face of the earth, that would be much, much worse than being concentrated in cities. We don't really know, though, is it better to have a lot of big cities or a few big cities or a lot of small cities? We don't know the answer to that. I think whatever can allow us to go about our daily lives without uh, too much, uh, uh, you know, walkab walkability and things like that are important. But I mean, I talk like this, and then every time I get on an airplane, and I do that a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's all over, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Are there any estimates of how much carbon dioxide would have to be taken out of the atmosphere for us to get down to that that yellow line that you showed in one of the graphs? Oh yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that. We have a person here who works, who's an expert on carbon, uh, uh, Kevin Gurney, and he, he probably could give you the answer of that off the top of his head, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I, yeah, I, I'm sure that there are. Uh, what, what sort of an effort would be necessary, you know? Um, a massive es effort. I, yeah, <laughs> it seems like, you know, you could tell an individual, we need to drive less, we need to, we could, yeah. you know, everyone in the room could do that, but, yeah. you know, yeah, so you have these multiple scales of human decision, right? Um, I can decide that I'm going to ride my bike to work every day and that I'm going to try to, you know, really reduce my automobile um, driving and my personal consumption habits and so forth. And like I said, every time I get on an airplane, all that just goes, is canceled, <laughs> right? Um, but then we have decisions that are made at the level of institutions like ASU is doing a lot to try to reduce carbon emissions. Cities are doing a lot to try to reduce carbon emissions. National level, we have a lot of argument going on. You know, you're the big emitter, you're the one that needs to cut it out. Um, but then we have all these other growing economies where understandably people want to be able, as their economies grow, to have the lifestyle that they see on TV that we have. And, you know, is it really fair to say, no, you can't have that. You know, we've screwed up the atmosphere, but, you know, stop. No more emitting. You guys can't do it. So there's lots of issues associated with that. Um, yes? What can, what can farmers uh, do? 70% of water is used for agriculture. And when I moved here, that number was 90%, by the way. Um, and what can, what can agricultural uh, folks, people, farmers do to help? Um, I, you know, I, there, are, there are sort of cultural aspects of uh, farming in Arizona that I think are um, well worth preserving. I am not sure if it was the right experiment, the idea of greening the desert that was, that was begun in the uh, early 1900s. Um, what can be done? Uh, agricultural systems are using a lot of water. They are, they are a source of carbon capture, but it's very small compared to what we're actually putting out there. Um, Hang on to your water rights so the city can't grow. No, <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm just not a very satisfying answer. I'm not sure what um, what what to say there. Um, I mean, I think that the trends have been that agriculture is increasingly being retired and going over to development. And um, I do think that a sustainable way to live in the desert is probably going to involve that. You know, most people living in cities. Um, but I'm not sure what the best, um, it's a researchable question, what the best uh, configuration is. Thanks. Yes? What about the accuracy to the claim that we're in the 15th year of a major drought in much of the southwest? Uh, I've heard that quite a bit in the Republic and other Yeah, that's a, it's fairly accurate. It um, so 15th year of a major drought, yeah. Uh, this has been a very dry period the last uh the last 15 years, um, intervening, you know, occasional intervening 
years that are less so, but it has been a, a super dry period um, compared to, if you look at the long-term record. Um, there was some talk at one point, um, you know, the 1950s in the Southwest was an extremely dry period, uh, sort of one of these really, really big droughts, and there was some talk about a 50, approximately 50-year 50 periodicity of some global um, forcings that, uh, that might result in um, another drought happening about now. Um, so I, th I think it's pretty true. I mean, New Mexico is probably in worse uh, shape than, than Arizona. There is a um, newsletter that's put out by CLIMAS that has uh, updates every month on what's going on with drought situation. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a Yeah. Yeah. That's what my data show. <laughs> um so so the so the the idea was that there was a very wet period between um 90 75 and 95. Uh, and, you know, I started working in Sycamore Creek in 1978, and we actually use this graph that shows the, um, the stream flow from 1978 until now. And when we were first formulating our hypotheses about the way this stream functioned, it was during this very wet period. And then all of a sudden things started to shift because it became very dry. So it's really interesting. Um, and, and, of course, everybody knows the story about the Colorado River allocations that were made during a period of relative, uh, relatively um, high flows in the Colorado. So having that long-term perspective is hugely important and um, the tree ring record is great because it goes way back to millennia in some cases. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Was there a question over here and now we have one more? I think there was. Yeah, I think in general, at least yeah. So what does it mean for the mountain park preserves? That's a, that's a really great question. I think there's a lot of uh, evidence that um, the, you know, for the southwest deserts that the combination of um, invasive species, uh, grasses in particular, things like red brome and buffalo gra grass, uh, that are a particular characteristic of highly variable year-to-year -year precipitation. So we can have years when there's <coughs> when there's uh, really quite a lot of rainfall and some of the mountain slopes start to look like Ireland, right? You know, you've all seen that. Mm -hmm. And then that's all fuel that's developed there. And so uh, fire is potentially going to be a real issue uh, in some of the, and, and already is a real issue in some of the um, uh, mountain and desert preserves uh, around, the, around the city. And especially given the proximity to the city, you have the, the chances increasing of, of fire occurring or of these invasives uh, sort of spreading out into those areas. Uh, so that seems like one of the, you know, the first ones that I would think about uh, as, as, a, as a potential threat to these, um, these things. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm done because I can't <laughs> think anymore. Uh, thank you all for thank listening. You. Appreciate it. <laughs>